Paula Kitson, occupational therapist here in town. Is it working now? Okay. And I was going to give a little bit more background as to how this all came about today. And um, I want to thank all of you for taking your taking time out of your schedule today to come and learn a little bit more about informed appointing. It's been an interesting journey for me, and I hope that this starts an interesting journey for all of you as well. And I wanted to do a little bit more in the way of an introduction um, for Diane, because I think she deserves a little bit more credit than we've already given her. Um, I met Diane almost five years ago when she walked up to me and said, I hear you're an occupational therapist, and would you like to see my son? And I'm awfully glad that I said yes, because it's been an interesting journey from that moment on. Um, fast forward two years, she comes into therapy one day, has a sheepish look on her face and says, I think Logan can write. And I said, no way, but he can. And then fast forward a couple months and I said, Diane, not only can Logan write, he can read. And we both celebrated and the journey continued. Fast forward a, about a year later, Diane started communicating with our two presenters via email. And she said to me, she goes, I think we should go to Los Angeles and meet with them. And I said, sure, thinking, there's no way that's going to happen. And about six weeks later, we were on a plane to Los Angeles. And we had a wonderful trip and came back completely inspired. And Diane said, I think we better have a workshop. And again, I said, sure, it sounds good. <laughs> I really got to learn to say no to that woman. And so here we all are today. Um, she's just been an inspiration to so many people. She has relentlessly worked to discover and to help her son. And she's moved mountains for him, and I'm just so proud of her. And so, Diane, hats off to you, and thank you for today. Well, many of you have probably heard this story, but I, I think it um, bears repeating. On one time, after we got back from Los Angeles, I and I were kind of preparing to do a little talk about what we learned and, and how our trip had gone. And we were doing this at the end of one of my therapy sessions with Logan. And Logan was kind of dancing around and bumping into us and generally being kind of a nuisance. And finally, I looked at Logan and I said, Logan, is there something you want to say? And Diane just said, no, just ignore him and you know, move along. But I said, Logan, really, do you have something you want to say? And finally, he went and got a piece of paper and a pencil and handed it to me. And so I gave him a little bit of touch, which I do when he writes. And what he wrote that day is this, and I think it's worth sharing with all of you today, too. I said, Logan, do you have something you want to say? And he wrote, yes. And then he wrote, tell them that we can write to talk. So I think that summarizes what we're all here for today. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce our two wonderful um, speakers, the first of which is Portia Iverson. And um, she's the one that wrote the book, Strange Son. She has signed the books and back. I've read the book twice. I really recommend it. Um, and Portia's son, Dove, was diagnosed with autism in 1994. And soon thereafter, um, Portia and her husband, John, became advocates devoted to accelerating autism research with the goal of finding treatment and hopefully a cure for autism. Portia is co-founder of Cure Autism Now and the Autism Genetic Resource Exchange. She is currently a member of the Autism Speaks High Risk, High Impact Committee and chair of Characterizing Cognition in Nonverbal Individuals with Autism Spectrum Disorder. She is the author of the book Strange Son and it's a story of her, how her nonverbal son began to communicate at the age of nine. Um, in 2007, she established the strangesun.com online community, a website that I recommend that all of you take a look at. And it's for families and professionals who want to help nonverbal and low communicating individuals with autism spectrum disorder. She lives with her um, husband and family in California, and she came to our cold climate for this event, and we sure appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you, Portia. And our second presenter today is Heather Clare. Um, Heather is a graduate of the University of Southern California with a master's degree in occupational therapy. 
Um, Heather has been teaching students, teachers, and staff the informative pointing method at a non-public school in Los Angeles. She's developed a classroom model using the informative pointing method to teach an academic curriculum to nonverbal students with autism. Her mission is to continue her work with children and young adults with autism, parents and professionals, teaching them how to access academics and communicate through pointing, typing, and writing. And I can tell you from personal experience, Logan fell in love with Heather at first sight. So she's a good gal. And Heather, thank you for being here. And I think I'll, at that, I'll, with that, I'll turn it over to Portia. Well, thank you everybody for being here today. It, it, it's, um, it's really an honor to be here. And for me, it's kind of a momentous occasion. It's uh, for me personally, and I know for Heather and Diane too, it's, it's been a big journey to get here. And really my part of the talk is more about that story of how we ended up here, why we think that probably so many nonverbal and low communicating children with autism and people have far more intelligence than most people think. And um, I want to say also that I think Paula said it pretty much already, but uh, I was so impressed with Diane because she joined our community website, which is to help people, uh, families who have nonverbal kids or members. And the next thing I know, Heather says she's going to be a, in a hotel near the airport with Logan. And could I stop by? I was really surprised. I said, well, yeah, sure. And I came over. And you know, a lot of people who have someone in their family or they work with someone who is nonverbal or maybe they can speak, but they just can't communicate, um, it's exhausting. It's tiring. It's difficult. It's frustrating. It's challenging on every level, personally. and and, and uh, you know, um, emotionally and professionally to work with people who are like this. And I was so impressed with Diane that not only did she fly to LA to meet Heather, but she brought the whole thing back here for you guys and for everybody, not just for her son, but for everyone. Because as um, I suspect most of you here know, there's very little for children or people who are nonverbal or who can't communicate at all. Um, could I ask how many people here either have a family member or a teacher or therapist or directly work with in some way a nonverbal person with autism or someone who just can't communicate? That's pretty much what I thought. So um, I want to thank you all for being here because I really think, uh, I call it historic because I think that where autism was 20 years ago, where they thought that all people with autism were mentally retarded, and then lo and behold, over a period of time, they realized that the higher functioning people or those who could speak and communicate had normal intelligence, remember? That kind of came about over time. I think that this crowd, which in my estimation, nobody really knows, but is maybe 20% of autism, maybe? that this group is where autism was 20 years ago. And we are the people who are going to start the work of getting at what's really going on in those minds and finding ways that these children and people can access communication. So I see it as, a, you know, all of you are like um, Annie Sullivan to Helen Keller. So, <laughs> so and, and, and so I really do very sincerely mean that I thank you for being here because I know you believe in the person who's in your family or who you care about or who you work with or you wouldn't be here today. So some of this I'm going to skip through really fast. I have a lot of background here, but I, I, it, it was a very interesting journey. My son, as, as Paula mentioned, I think, um, didn't communicate till he was nine. And um, this first picture here, you probably, most of you may have heard of Tito a boy from India, and that's my son Dove next to him. They were on the cover of the American Journal of Psychiatry, and you'll see why. So on this, this talk's going to have two parts. It's a pretty long talk. I've never given a two-hour talk, I'm going to admit it. Now it's an hour and a half <laughs> le left somehow. <laughs> thanks, thanks for straggling in. It s saved me. <laughs> but the first part's going to be kind of my story. And then I'm going to stop for five minutes if anyone has to make a quick bathroom run. If there's any questions, there probably won't be that many questions. The second part is more about the informative pointing method. I've left all the practical, mechanical part to Heather because she has so wonderfully created 
a standardized manual for how to use this in the classroom and for education. And I don't want to muck up, you know, I don't want to throw, I, I know a lot about it, but I haven't done what she's done, which is put it into a format that you guys can really use. But I do talk about um, the, the concept, the theory, the model, and the kind of a developmental model of it in the second part. Then we can have more questions, discussion, and then we'll take a really nice long 15 minute, 20 minute break, depending on how time's going. And then it's gonna be Heather. So just so you know. <laughs> um, so don't worry, I'm not gonna go over the entire history of autism, but <laughs> I just wanna say that it is a new disorder, really. It really wasn't described until the early 40s. 20 years later, Bruno Bettelheim, as you all know, uh, described the refrigerator mother, and that was pretty much put the kibosh on autism research because, can you imagine, I mean, if you were, and there may be if some parents in here like this, I don't know, but if you were a parent of a child who had such a devastating disorder as autism and you were blamed by the professionals of your day, I mean, it, it, was, it was so terrible, and I'm telling you this only because there's a really bad distrust between scientists, researchers, you know, and parents for many, many years. And this is what we came up against, you know, when we, our son was diagnosed with autism. He's almost 16 now. He's gonna be 16 on Monday. And when he was diagnosed with autism at 21 months, uh, and you know, I was very naive and I, I turned to the books and we didn't have the internet yet. Luckily it came around a couple of years later and said, you know, I just thought scientists were working on diseases, you know, everything being equal and they were all working on it. And, I was so shocked to discover that it was thought to be psychological, emotional, caused by trauma, bad parenting, and this, you know, this, we were just barely coming out of that phase, and that there was almost no research at all going on. I'm just gonna read you this little tiny thing here, it's from my book, but for anyone who's a parent and has, has lost a child into autism, uh, I think it, you know, this was how I felt anyway. Night after night, I sat beside his crib. I knew he was slipping away from us, away from our world and there was nothing I could do to stop it from happening. There was nothing anybody could do, they told me. So I did the only thing I could. I guarded him, although I knew it would do no good because I could not guard his mind. And then one day it happened. He was gone. And that was really the experience of having a child slip into autism before your eyes. It's exactly the same today as it was then. And there's no professional you can go to who can tell you what to do to stop it or to save the child. So I say 30 years later, that was my introduction to autism. That's my son when he was about five. Now, um, I'm going to, you'll have to bear with me a couple of times here because I have to switch over to DVDs and to on-screen movie files uh, periodically, but it only takes a second, okay. Um, hold on one second. Just a second, bear with me while I, okay. All right, good. There we go. This is, uh, this is a little bit hard to watch. This is 10 minutes long. And it's very informative. Uh, it's a videotape of my son from the age of four months to 13 years old. And we rarely see autism unfold. Mm -hmm. You know, we see it as a toddler, we see it as a kid, as a high school student, but we rarely see it all like that. And you're just gonna see his progression. And I think it's, it's, it's very interesting to see and going from being uh, kind of socially related to disappearing into autism to emerging, communicating later. Tell me if it's, well, Roger's gonna be standing by if it's too loud. It wasn't too long after John and I was there that we had Dove and we were so happy. He was just an adorable baby. This is it's a heartbreak. This is John. This is Roger. This is John. We're just playing with him and I think you can see. Can you hear okay? He likes, he's easily startled, but how much he likes playing. Here I am. About four months old, five months old. You don't think there's regression, but there is. Rock him on my foot. So I, I 
think I see some social expressions here. attempts to crawl, like Tidal Bound describes. The two halves of the body aren't working so well together. We have babbling. These are sounds adult can no longer make. Looking back, even now, these home movies, Dove looked very related and sociable. He did not look autistic early on. <laughs> we began to notice something was wrong between his first birthday and 18 months old. Dove is around two here, and he's just been diagnosed with autism. And I think you can see Dad's trying to get joint attention. He's having a rough time. Do you have a toy that has eggs? No, do you, have a, do you have a toy on the shelf? No, look. Do you have a toy that has yellow eggs? Do you want some? Do you want some of this one? hear that there's no imaginary play in autistic children. <laughs> 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 Dove was much better at this back then than he is now. He's lost these skills.
PEC system, the picture exchange system, which we used for a few years. Send strip. What is that? The I want noodles. You want noodles too? Yeah? Hi, Bill. Say hi. Hi, who? Hi. I'm mom. about nine here, just before he started to communicate. Doby, back to earth. Back. Big voice, ball. Nothing was yeah. turning things towards the kind of life we wanted Dove to have very quickly. When Dove was nine, I had met Soma and Tito, and Soma eventually was able to get Dove to begin pointing at letters, and in this way, Dove started to communicate and really showed us that he had normal intelligence and an intact mind. A galaxy is okay, uh, come on. G, <coughs> R, O, U, P, group, S, D, A, come on. R S group of stars, yes. It is a group yeah. of stars. By the time Dove was twelve, we had to start our own school because his behaviors continued to be very autistic, but his communication okay. skills were improving and he was very capable of learning and he wasn't getting the kind of education he deserved, especially with what his struggle is come on. You know, to type. So we started our own school, and this is Jill, his teacher, uh, who taught him for almost three years. Dove's gotten totally caught up to grade level now. Is something bothering you? Yes, what is it? You're saying this in a mirror, yes. so it's flipped. What's that called? This is hard spelling. Go ahead, tell me. I and next is, and the next is, go. Get it? A, next is, go. He's actually you using his is. right hand, too. <laughs> it's just flipped. Go ahead. G and next is. U and next is. R and go. Look. Get it? Look. B. A. Okay. And next is. T and next is. Show me. Look. Get it? Come on. Alright. That's right. And next is. Look. And next is. Backgrounds and now they were led to get to run for president. Who do you feel is more experienced? Come on. This is 
the last election. <laughs> <laughs> You see, we have a big mirror on a tilt behind it. And this way, if you're working with someone and you want to videotape, you get the board and their bodies, the whole thing, all in one shot. And it's instead of having two cameras. R and next move. Come on. Come on. Come on. We just glued a plastic mirror onto a blackboard. So that, you can see, is, is quite a progression. So I'm just going to take you through really fast here. Um, this is uh, 1995. Dove is three years old. We started the Cure Autism Now Foundation because there was just absolutely no, I'm going to show you this little film in a couple minutes. There was just no money in the field. Um, just to show you, there was a little over five million five million dollars a year for the entire budget for autism research back then. I mean, if you can imagine, that's enough for a nationwide newsletter. And now it's over a hundred million. Um, it could use a lot more, but it's, it's a lot better. So my husband, John Shestak, and I started Cure Autism Now to fund research because we found out there wasn't any. And we started this gene bank, which had genetic materials, but also blood samples and all this phenotypic uh, clinical data, and it, it's now the world's largest. It's uh, got <coughs> over a thousand families that have two or more affected members, and um, it's probably been the biggest thing we did because it enabled hundreds of researchers to do research who could never collect those samples or, or you know, um, characterize those families. So that was the thing we thought was best. Anyway, this is just really quick. We got a, whereas autism was off the map, we got various, you know, celebrities involved, and uh, Clinton uh, signed the 2000 Child Health Act, which greatly increased at that time uh, funding for autism research at the NIH, and awareness began to grow. This slide was kind of funny to me because I remember looking at this and thinking, wow, it's, we're getting so aware of autism, and of course this is maybe a, two years ago, this slide, and now everywhere you turn, you probably notice it's like there's really a lot of awareness, and at the same time, these cases kept seeming to increase and increase uh, up to today, uh, CDC reporting one in every 150 children having autism. So I just as a demonstration of how autism is increasing worldwide, that's my great aunt in Norway. <laughs> and when I went to visit, uh, this is the youngest great aunt, I discovered she was an autism therapist <laughs> doing pecs. That means house, rune. <laughs> I didn't even know it. I, I mean, I thought, you know, where can I turn anymore that I'm not going to find autism, right? I'm sure you all feel that way. Okay, I'm going to get to the part now about Soma and Tito, which is how we discovered this whole thing. I mean, I think we have to really credit them. Um, and this is in my book, too. It's just a small bit I'm going to read to you. There is a small group of people in this world to whom an event so devastating has occurred that they may even have stopped believing in God. Yet the one characteristic those struck by lightning share possibility of miracles. The very fact that something so impossibly terrible could have happened makes the chance of a miracle seem just as possible. Although I didn't recognize it in myself, I am certain it was this vulnerability to miracles that was at work when I first heard of Tico, Tito Mukopadhyay. 